So I'm going to talk about data near here today, an application that I wrote. Um, how many of you have been at previous Postgres users group meetings where I talked about this? A number of you. Okay. So I'm going to, it's kind of a split presentation. I don't want to go over too much of the material that I've covered previously because I want to get on some other interesting stuff, but I have to explain some stuff about the application that we're running in order for the second half to make sense. So. I'm going to give a very quick, high-level overview of the application that won't give you enough information to really explain what's going on. I'd like to set that understanding <laughs> early, um, and then move on to some of the, the newer work that, that I've been doing in the last couple of years. Um, I've been told that my target for this after-lunch presentation was to have nobody snoring by the end of the, before the end of this hour. So that's, that's my performance standard that I'm going to try and achieve. Um, I've just finished my PhD at Portland State literally a month, couple of months ago. So this particular... Yay. Thank you, thank you. Um, I'm a living example of it's never too late to start and sometimes not too late to finish either. Um, so this big data uh, comic really hit home to me. If data fails the teacher's t-test, you can just force it to take the test again until it passes, which is also relevant to the big data application that I'll be telling you about that I've been working on. I'll start with disclaimers. Um, after I finished my PhD, I went on a, an extended vacation, um, followed by another not quite so extended vacation. So there are a whole bunch of details that have fallen out of my head in the meantime. Um, that's my excuse, my pre-existing excuse for some of the questions that you'll no doubt ask that I'll know I did know the answers to but no longer do. The application that I've done, that I've written, Data Near Here, it was written as research. When we started it, uh, pretty much everybody thought that I was you know, crazy and smoking something and that it couldn't be done. So, of course, I wasn't particularly worried about scaling when I started down the path that I went down. Uh, then it worked really well, so now we're worried about scaling something that wasn't designed with that in mind. So um, that'll explain some of the oddities of the corners I've painted myself into and I'm now trying to find my way back out of again. And I'm not a UI designer and it's not the focus of my research. So the thing is ugly and I'm a back-end person and that was far more interesting to me. With the disclaimers out of the way, the problem that I set out to solve is Scientists are having difficulty finding data relevant to their research questions. Um, the scientists that I, I work with up at a place called CMOP, Coastal Margin Observation and Prediction, which is part of OHSU, they started about 15 years ago collecting data. And at the time, they would go out on ocean cruises and collect a water sample, maybe five or six or 10 water samples, and they'd come back and they'd study those intensively for a year, taking little slides and, and looking at them through microscopes. And then a year later, they'd go and collect another five or 10. Now they've moved to an environment where they go out on a cruise for a month and water comes through pipes through the boat and comes through a little flattening device that is basically about the size of a, a, a micro, microscopic slide and gets photographed. And so now they're getting essentially the results of a water sample every three milliseconds, and they have months of this data. They also now have um, sensors up and down the Columbia River and the coast that are also collecting data every few 
milliseconds. And because the instruments keep changing and they're expensive, they keep moving them to other places. So the instruments are migrating from place to place. Um, and there's this massive amount of data that's now being collected, terabytes of data. And the scientists can't keep track of it. They, they can know intellectually that there's stuff that they've collected. They don't know where to find it in the file system. This is a model of some of the data fo formats and data access tools that they're using. Each new type of data gets stored in whatever format is convenient or designed by that particular manufacturer. Um, there are different tools that are being created to access each of these different types of data. And you ha in order to analyze any of the data, you have to know where it came from, when it came from, where it got filed in the, store, in, the, in the archive, in what format, to be accessed by which tools, and what's the naming standard that was used by the scientist or data administrator who was there at the time. And then you have to be able to find the thing. So they don't know. They can't cope. They, they can know there's data out there. They tell us, and, and this is not just this place. I've read this, I've got other citations. There are scientists who routinely abandon productive and interesting research questions because finding the data that they're interested in is too hard. And they spend up to 80% of their time just locating the data. Now imagine how much more productivity you could get if you could solve that problem by giving them, essentially, a Google for data. So that's what we set out to do. That's what I set out to do. Um, an example information need, just to, to give you a sense of what a query looks like to them, is observations collected near a particular location in a particular time with some variable, in this case temperature, in some range between 5 and 10 centigrades. And this turns out to be the way that they describe data to each other. Right? If you have a scientist and he's describing to some other scientist what data he's looking for, this is his description. This will be very close to his description for these kinds of environmental data of the scientists that I'm dealing with. There's a bunch of common approaches that um, people have tried. Uh, data access approaches, so menu selections and panels. It's great if you know exactly where to find the data, what the naming standard was, which filing system it was in. You can select your way down through the, a series of menus to find it. Um, it doesn't scale. There's text-based search of metadata, which is great if somebody actually bothers annotating all of the data, which nobody does. Um, one of the big things that everybody keeps addressing as the problem, saying is the problem, as the solution to the problem is visualization. Um, and they have all these solutions where you can visualize a million points at this, of data at the same time, which is great if you can actually recognize the visual signal of what you're looking for in the representation in those million data points. And it's great if you have a million data points. It doesn't work if you've got a billion because you don't have time to look at a million data points that many times to, to find the, the, uh, the particular visual signal you're interested in. So it doesn't scale. So the scientists we're working with, they actually have access to all of these tools that everybody else says will solve the problems. And they've said that they don't work. And they brought us the problem. You know, please help us. My solution was to build a data set search engine. This is my ugly interface, because I'm not a UI designer. Uh, the top section is, in essence, the, the search section. Um, there's also a map display, both of the search box. You can see the square box there that you can relocate as needed. These lines and uh, points of various kinds are data that came back after this search was executed. And this is, in fact, the search that, that, uh, that I just had on the previous slide. So, we're looking in this particular area um, in mid-2010. We're looking for temperature between 5 and 10 centigrade. You can, in fact, add search terms, delete search terms. You don't have to have a space term. You don't have to have an, a, um, a, a time term. You can just look for a particular, some variable in some, some range in some units. The bottom section is a ranked list of matches that came back. 
and this is very much modeled as a data version of standard Google, the Google search approach. So you can see there's no data set in this entire archive that is a complete match. The, high, the score, a, a perfect match of something that matched all of those search terms would be 100. The highest score we've got is 97. So there's nothing in the entire archive that actually matches what the scientist says they were looking for. So is this, is this bounding box is detecting the uh, devices collecting data in the area? No, the bounding box is saying, this is what I'm looking for. Anything, any data from this area? Any data, what, what I'm ideally looking for, in, in my perfect universe, I would find data that's in this physical location from this time period that contains data in this range. And the answer is the archive doesn't have any. But what it does have is it's got some things that are pretty close. They, um, let me look here. The temperature isn't quite between 5 and 10 degrees centigrade. It's 10.6 to 10.85. But it's, and it's not quite in the right time. It's outside the time frame that I'm looking for, by, but, but not by much. Um, and the, the location, if I clicked on all these lines, I could show you that actually the location, it overlaps with what I'm looking for. This is as close as I get. And then everything else in the archive gets you know, progressively further away. This temperature is a little further away. The date is in the time range. The location is a little further away than what I'm looking for. You can see I'm returning things that are completely outside the bounding box. But they actually have pretty close temperature and pretty close time to what I'm looking for. So this is standard. Google hopes to give you back the perfect answer of exactly what you're looking for. And if it doesn't find anything like that, it gives you back the best that it's got in, in an order that it hopes is useful to you. Does that answer your question? Yes. OK. So can I ask that, is that an editorial statement and we take disappointment on the map? <laughs> no. <laughs> That's just where it is. Mm -hmm. That's where we hope not to be. Exactly. But for those of you who care, this is actually the Astoria Megla Bridge. Oh. So it goes to an invisible place called, that used to be called Megla on the other side, but is now called. Um, uh, uh, the other side. No, no, it's called something like, it's not quite Depression Hole, but it's some name like that because Lewis and Clark was stuck there for a week, oh, yeah. and that is clearly more important than somebody who actually lived there and had a fishing, owned a fishing factory there for 50 years. Yeah. Yes, there you go. Um, so my contributions. Uh, the top one, the principal contribution is to define a new problem, mm -hmm. is a comment from an anonymous review who rejected the paper that um, it was in. Uh, defined a new, well, defined a new problem, defined an approach to the problem, which was applying standard information retrieval techniques from internet search to this. So I'm not using um, uh, where data warehousing concepts at all. It's, it's, I've come entirely from information retrieval. Developed a prototype that I can demo if we have time that's in production with the scientists. Um, defined a formal model and componentized architecture for it, and I'll show you the architecture in a moment, evaluated it. Did two user studies, um, one for the similarity function and the other one actually of the system itself and proved that it rocks. Um, actually, this works so well that one of the people on my dissertation committee is Alon Halevi, who is the head of database research at Google. And in my dissertation defense, his key question to me was how, you know we have data search as well at Google, how come your solution works so much better than ours does? Um, and evaluated techniques to improve scalability. And this last one's the piece that I want to talk about in the second half of the presentation. Um, more contributions, there was a patent, a heap of papers, and a PhD. Um, there's also a bunch of presentations that would have made the font too small, so I didn't put them on here. But if you're interested in more information, 
on exactly what I did and how I did it. There's a heap of stuff out there that will help you sleep beautifully at night. So, basic architecture that I used. Um, how many of you are familiar with an extremely similar looking diagram from information retrieval land? Uh, a couple of you. Okay, so the way that internet search works is um, Google, they have crawlers that go and read all the stuff that's out on the internet, and they extract features is the information retrieval term um, from all of those, uh, from all the HTML pages. Mostly the features are words or images. They used to be just words, now they're words, images, a few other data types. And they, they munge that data and create a, um, a catalog of all of that, that data, of all of those features. In the internet world, this is mostly a count, each, the name of each document, and then a count of how many times each word appeared in that document. Uh, plus some other things that have added as the, the decades have gone on and Google and Bing have started competing more. But this was the, the original version was just count of words for each document. Mm -hmm. Then, so this is all done asynchronously. This can all be done slowly as things change. They eventually show up in the metadata catalog. As soon as something shows up in the catalog, it can be searched for interactively. And there's a search interface. Um, the search terms that you enter go to a scoring and ranking machine ranking system that reads the metadata catalog and decides how close which things are to your search terms and produces a result. And I've done pretty much taken exactly the same concept except I have scientific archives of data on one side coming in um, asynchronously, crawl them for whatever data types I understand at any point in time. You know, read the data once, extract features, stick it in the catalog, and then I have an interactive search system that allows you to enter terms. You just saw that a moment ago. Add scoring and ranking, produce an output, and then from that, those, um, from that screen, you can directly download the data directly into analysis tools. The technologies that I use to do it, um, I'm working with the OHSU CMOP people and they had an infrastructure in place and I just used that infrastructure. So Postgres, it's now 9.1, it wasn't that when I started. Um, I use Crosstab heavily for reasons that will become clear in a bit. PostGIS 2.0 because there's a lot of spatial data that I'm dealing with. PHP, I don't remember what version, Python 2.6. Um, I'd be interested at the end of the presentation if people want to come talk to me about what other, how to implement what I'm talking about in other technologies, because I hadn't thought about it at the time. Um, I use these post-GIS functions. So <coughs> I, I'm a pretty decent user of, of, uh, of post-GIS, and um, that's been a, an interesting and educational experience, um, particularly when it comes to the performance side of things. And I've at times modified my design in order to improve performance as a result of that. So post-GIS and the spatial component of my data would be one of the biggest things preventing me from using to some other, going to some other platform. But I am about to start talking to the OHSU people about genomics data, which isn't spatial in the same sense, in that I'm probably not going to be using distance functions, or distance calculations. And so re-implementing this in another technology may actually make sense now that I'm looking at such a different set of data to apply the same principles to. So this is what my system actually looks like. Um, this stuff in the, in the box, it's been interesting. So I, was, I spent decades in industry and before I went into, res into the academic world and, and research. And one of the things I discovered is that the professors do not like any diagram that has color on it. So any, any diagram with colors automatically reject, they, they don't process it. Uh, that was, anyway, it's a very interesting experience moving into academia, which is why this picture has no color on it. Um, 
the stuff inside the dashed box is the stuff that got added when I put data near here into CMOP's infrastructure. Um, so it's, it's purely additive. I didn't replace anything they currently had. They already had sensors, a processing platform, a repository for the observation data that was repository. I use the word loosely. It's a combination of technologies and has Postgres stuff and a whole bunch of different file formats that I showed you on the earlier slide. Um, and, then, and then people extract that data and use analysis programs against it. And I kind of linked into all of this. Um, but my design, I, I kind of started with their data because you know they were the ones paying me. Um, but my design is general. I don't actually care about where the data lives so long as I can create, so long as I can read it from somewhere and create a link to it. I can process many people's archives, and I, in fact, have data that has nothing to do with CMOP in this archive that's searchable just the same way that the, the CMOP data is. I don't differentiate in any way. So that's all pretty standard. So what feature extraction do I actually do, since I'm clearly not just getting words from HTML documents here? Um, when I scan each data set, I pull out some basic global metadata, which are things like uh, the data location, the data format, the count of how many data items are in that, in that particular file. And I create features, individual column features. So for anything which is a table format, I take each column name, salinity, temperature, time, and call that a feature, and I figure out the minimum and maximum value in that particular column. Um, and I store that. So if somebody wants a data set that has temperature between 5 and 10 centigrade, well, this this data set has a column called temperature, and temperature is between 8.2 and 14.6, so yes, there is data between 5 and 10 centigrade in that particular column. If somebody wants to, a data set that has that temperature and it has fluorescence, well, you know, it just wants to have some fluorescence data, don't care what units, don't care what value. This data set matches the temperature term, but there's no fluorescence column, so it won't match that term. So this allows me to do the similar, you know, you've put in five words to Google and it returns documents that have three of those words, but not the other two. That's my analog in this space. I don't have that variable. I have no location data, but I have time. Um, uh, you can search on um, the quality of, because that turned out to be important in this space, is what quality is the data, is it raw data, or has it been verified? So in essence, this is what I've captured as my analog of the index information for an HTML document in, in text information retrieval, right? And these, this is what I store in my metadata catalog. I mean, you can kind of tell. It looks like a table and columns. And I don't care what kind of data I've got. Um, I, I handle 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D data. I'm completely neutral about the dimensionality. I don't completely neutral about what format, data format, so long as I can read it. I don't care where it is, so long as I can give you a location for it. I don't care what the variables are, what their ranges are, what their units are. I just have a simple abstraction over, over all of that variability. It's really cool. What's also really cool is um, the adaptive hierarchy, uh, which I'll be talking about the performance of later, because it creates it's a really cool solution to one problem that creates some really cool problems someplace else. 
what they'll often do is they'll have a really big data set. So this particular data set, I'm just showing the time span here, runs from 2007 to 2010. And I can programmatically chop this so that it appears to be multiple smaller data sets and then treat those, you know, sort of link them together into a hierarchy, basically the same way you would if you had a big data set and you were writing a scan where you were selecting, you know, more and more restrictive subsets of it. That's in essence what I'm doing. So I can take this four-year data set and it, I can segment it so that it has data, you know, this set of data from May to November 2009, this set of data over here from 20 to 10. Um, it happens to have a, a space. Uh, you were asking about time series data. There's a space here where the, the, there was no data collected from that sensor. There's another space here. There's some data from February to August. And then even within each one of these, I can segment it down you know, another level where I've got February and May and August. And I can arbitrarily create as many different um, levels of hierarchy as I want to. This is all, right now this is done by a human saying, you know, I think somebody might want to search this data by breaking it down into, you know, years, months, days. Um, but you see the same pattern happen over and over again. And you only just have to make these decisions about how you want to break it down once for each type of data. So each scanner basically has a set of rules in it that applies. It would be very easy to just to automate that and, and make that even more intelligent. And we just haven't done that yet. And you can be completely different for each scanner or each type of data what, in terms of what makes sense to the scientists. So I'm dealing with oceanographers and microbiologists. Very different mindsets in terms of what kind of data they're looking for and how they think about stuff. And so this data down here that I was showing you a moment ago is the stuff that comes from fixed stations that collect data for decades. And so one way of, you know, you want to segment that data one way. The microbiologists are very often collecting water samples where they go to a particular location in a boat and they collect water for a few minutes and they store that data in CSV format, you know, one row, one row per water sample. Um, and each of, so each row in this case is a separate sample. And so the segmentation is th that each row in this particular data set is a completely separate you know, searchable entity. Down here, it makes no sense to take the million plus observations and treat each one as a completely searchable entity because the oceanographers don't look at their data that way. The oceanographers tend to look in terms of days or months or, you know, which model am I trying to build and what's the starting point for that model. And so here, a completely different segmentation makes sense. And I treat all of these segmentations um, neutrally from the perspective of the metadata catalog. So I have all of these sort of stored in the same set of tables and searchable in exactly the same way. So that if in the search interface you come in looking for a year's worth of data, you'll get back the closest match, which is likely to be one of these year data sets. If you're searching for a day, you're more likely to get back one of these things that is close to the day that you're looking for mm -hmm. than you are this multi-year data set that might or might not have the day you're interested in it. Um, and so, for example, here, if my user search was June and July 2009, I'd come down and June and July 2009 would both get scores of 100 on that particular search term, and then each month further away gets a lower score. The entire year has some data you're interested in, but a heap of other data, that gets an even lower score. And so when I sort these from highest to lowest, 
these data sets that are very close match are the top of the list and, and things get progressively further away. So does that make sense in terms of the, the search concept that I'm on? Okay, cool. So production data volumes for what they've got today, they have 1.5 billion observations in their archive and I represent that those 1.5 billion observations as essentially 36,000 metadata records. Um, and I search over those depending on the search in a second or so. Um, and I have different, the three different geometry types, point, line, string, and polygon. The same search works for all of those. I'm, I don't care what shape the data is in, that what shape the data takes. Um, I'll find them no matter what they are. The average number of observations per leaf record, when I say child, a leaf record that's like the bottom level of the hierarchy, is about 42 and a half thousand observations. Uh, the minimum is one observation. I've got about 1,800 of those where it's just like literally one observation is different from everything else. And the maximum is 11.5 million um, in one very large, very similar data set. So I've got massive variety in terms of what, it, what one, one file, one observation is counted as being. Here's my physical data model. And basically, there are two key tables. There's one record in this for every data set or separately returnable segment of a data set. And every column within each data set has a row in this table. Um, that's it. And then there's some ancillary stuff that's used for management purposes. So is the metadata file is that one of those six thousand one? Yes. In production, yes. And there's about oh gosh, I used to, before I went on vacation I knew the multiplier to get you to the but it's about somewhere between five and ten, I think. Maybe seven on average, number of rows in the metadata variables for each row in the metadata files table. Um, now, this is a very easy, again, you know, I didn't expect this to work as well as it did when I started out. This is a really nice, easy data model when you're adding data sets. When the scanner comes along and finds more um, data sets that have variables that it's never run into before, it just adds them to the bottom of the metadata vars table and carries right on. Problem is that, that if you're trying to search over variables that or over search terms that are represented in this table and search terms represented in this table, you end up having to pivot this table and joining it to that. And your performance just goes off a cliff. I mean, it goes off a cliff so badly that I don't actually show any results for that performance because it sucks so bad. Um, this is one of the things that I would do differently if I was going to write these several thousands of lines of de now debugged and working code again. But, okay, so that's what the system is and does. So now I'm gonna shift gears and talk, into, talk about uh, scalability. Um, after I built it, and it worked great, and users loved it, and wanted more of it, it's like, okay, cool, this works really well. Um, now let's try and scale it. And I'm dealing with a billion and a half observations and the entire archive, and because, you know, because I'm a little crazy, I'm like, cool, if this works for CMOP, then what would it take to make it work for, like, NOAA? Or data.gov, or you know, something really meaty. 
And so it's like, okay, how about we try and do 100 times the amount of data with the same response time? Because, you know, wouldn't that be cool? As opposed to most of the other academic papers I read that say, wow, we've got this new algorithm to this known existing space and it works 3% better than the existing one, right? I'm like, okay, let's go for 100 times better. Um, the primary focus is the search side because the scanners, they, they're asynchronous and the moment something shows up in the metadata catalog, I search over it and I can just, I can breed more scanners, right? So long as the other end is willing to download data to me, hello, I can just add a whole bunch more scanners on a whole bunch more servers and create more metadata records more quickly. There's kind of no interesting problem there from my perspective. Um, so I was focused on the, the search side of it. And there's a whole heap of things that, that you could do. Um, there's some metadata catalog related factors like fixing the physical data design that I was just talking about. Um, and the piece here that we decided was interesting was what, what was the effect of different hierarchy shapes on um, on the search characteristics. And there's a bunch of search-related factors, and we decided to focus on one of those, the, the search evaluation techniques. Um, in the interests of time, I'll move on quickly. So I did some initial exploration of just basically where was the time spent in my application, and I'm sure it will shock all of you to discover that practically all the time was spent in searching and ranking results as opposed to in network transfer and building the map page. Um, and the first cut that we did had some pretty, I mean, there were response times in, you know, 6, 12 second range. Now, Compared to Google, that's pretty bad. On the other hand, Google's had a lot more people and a couple of decades to work on this. Um, and the scientists thought this was pretty cool because their alternative is to try and scan all the archives and write scanning programs in all of those languages. And so basically they just give up, right? So for them, 10 seconds is, compared to their other alternatives, is fantastic. But I found that if, if you made some changes and played with some stuff, I could get it down to about a second, a second and a half. Um, so this was the area that, that I ended up focusing on for the performance evaluation pieces. So the first thing set about to do was to streamline the basic scoring algorithm. And what I do in the basic scoring algorithm is, you know, s process the search parameters and I build an SQL query template and I actually walk down the hierarchy one level at a time. Mm -hmm. So the first query that I issue against the database only looks at roots of the trees. Mm -hmm. So the, the things that have no parent and I process each of those and build a list of which are the interesting, potentially interesting children. So which are the children that might have higher scores than, than the parent that I'm looking at. And then I issue a second query that goes after those. And then I keep walking down through the, um, through the hierarchy till I run out of hierarchy levels. And then I build, I sort the scores out of that set and return the top K entries. Now, there's a problem that as the table increases in size, the search execution time increases. So, 100 times the size of table, you know, 600 seconds, 1200 seconds is a whole different type of response problem. Now, note, these are top K queries. The tables are indexed. So, each of these metadata entries is in a post, is a, a row in a Postgres table. The Postgres tables have been tuned. Um, there's indexes built that are matched against the queries. I've already gotten as much performance as I can get out of the R tree and, um, mm. uh, and, and underlying Postgres 
tuning, right? So I'm now into application tuning land. And I can have spatial and no, non-spatial terms in the same SQL query. So if you have an, a, a query that has five terms, a, a search that has five terms in it, you know, a space, a time, some variable terms, I build a massive SQL query that has all of those terms in it. And so I'll be trying to use multiple indexes and whatever Postgres can do in terms of coming up with a really cool execution plan for me under the covers. Correct. I widen it significantly, yeah. and I um, also have to account for overlaps of various kinds. So if you have, so for example, if I'm looking for something that's in <coughs> 2014, yeah. and I have a data set that overlaps 2014 but goes back to 1900, I also have to be able to return all of those. Because that may have a child uh, record underneath it that, that is just 2014, somewhere further down the hierarchy. So what about I mean, you could convert all of the scalars to an interdimensional space and then basically create, you know, whatever dimensional spatial index on it. Um, that doesn't work for a reason that I knew before I went on vacation. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> and it, it might. I mean, it doesn't work for non scalers obviously. Right. The, um... mm. There's some. It, probably 2 a.m. tomorrow morning, I'll be able to answer that question again. But we, but we did go down that path, and it doesn't work. Um, it, yeah. Sorry. Yes. So uh, something I just like about doing for in searches to indention is counterexamples. Um, and the example that I saw was in Haskell, so it won't help you here. And I think we have more. And I know we can even learn from this. I was talking to them. But um, you you have an example of what it isn't. Mm -hmm. And just like you do in theory proving, you know, by counterdiction, um, you, you put in these counterexamples and it, it starts pruning away whole chunks of the. I kind of do that because it's a distance function. Yeah. And so anything that is, excuse me, anything that's too distant gets yeah, pruned. But this gives you more than yeah. it's yeah. too distant. It yeah. gives you other dimensions you can work with. Admittedly, I, I know somebody who did the n-dimensional implementation, but they did it as a form of approximate query. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you ask for the top 25, it would be giving you 25 out of the top 100. Mm -hmm but not necessarily the top point. Right, and, and one of the principles that I was working on was um, no, let me get this the right way around, no false negatives. So I, I, will turn, I will return you false positives, but I will not return false negatives. And, and I think one of those solutions, that, that that's the problem, is the false negative problem. Mm -hmm. There was a question over here as well. Partitioning helps um, scalability, but, but you still end up with having, so my view is, if you can solve the problem in one partition, then you don't even have to partition. If you can't solve the problem in one partition, you have to at least understand what your problem is in that partition because um, you can only partition so far, or at least you, you end up having to breed more partitions because of the because of a problem that you can't solve in the partition you have. And so partitioning could help you. If I could, sh if I could get 10 times performance out of one partition, then I can add 10 partitions to get me to 100 partitions. Um, I do have some trade-offs because I still have to combine the top end from each of those partitions, which does sort of breed a bit of a problem at the other end. 
But for this piece of it, I worked on the, just the piece of how far can I go in one particular, in, within one partition, and then I know that I can always add other methods of per performance improvement on top of that. Just like I can also, I mean, it's written in PHP and it's interpreted. Right, I could also improve performance by going to a compiled language, but that will only get me so far. It might not get me a hundred times. I guess my question is, is, is the performance problem that you're scanning too much data? Like you're scanning data that's not actually what you're looking for? Yes, but I don't know which data I'm not looking for until after I've got the top end back. That's the catch. The catch is the top end piece. Because the top end may, in fact, be really, really low scoring items. But I don't know that when I start. Um, so the thing that I did, uh, th there's a, a guy called Ilias who did a whole bunch of, um, he, he did a survey piece that looked at like 65 different techniques. And the one that was, the, and classified them all, and the one that was the best fit was filter restart, which I think gets to a little bit to a couple of the things you're saying. Um, which is you define an initial cutoff score that you hope, hope will work, which is in essence treated as a statistical sample of the database um, in terms of, okay, you know, let me take a statistical sample. If I'm really lucky, my top end will be within that statistical sample. And if I'm not, well, I, I basically restart with a bigger sample. Problem is, how do you identify a cutoff st score that will return more than K, but not too many more than K. Um, I read a heap of research papers on it, and the answer from everybody up until today is, well, the users and domain experts will be able to tell you that. And that solves the problem. Right, let's put I was... That's a hard problem, let's not solve it. Exactly, let's go and solve the much easier problems, because, you know, that's what domain exports are for. Um, so, the official term for this is relaxation and restart. You, you define a filter, and if the filter that you randomly chose as a starting number um, doesn't come back with enough, you then come up with a wider filter and do a restart, and if that doesn't come back with enough, you set an even lower score and try again. So how do you choose those revised cutoff scores? Uh, I did a bunch of tests. Um, naive, which is, um, I reduced it by a fixed number each time, but naive sounds much more, much more impressive. <laughs> and adaptive. Um, adaptive was using the scores that I found in using the, the array of scores that I had calculated so far to figure out what, the, what a good cutoff score would be. So if I've gotten back a set of, of scores and none of them actually match, if I've calculated a set of scores from what I got back from my filter and I don't actually have enough, I can use that number to guess at what a good number would be. And then what happens if you set the filter a little bit wider? So you happen to start out with a query and filter combination, search and filter combination, in an area where there's no data. And so you get nothing back. And so then you say, OK, I'm going to set my parameters a bit wider. And there happens to be this big cluster of data just over here. And all of a sudden, you get back a massive number of things, which can happen very easily. Um, and then you get bad performance because now you've got too many. And so I came up with contraction, which was, OK, if I'm at a query, if I'm at a particular level in the hierarchy and I get back way too many, then I'm going to raise the score for the filter as I go further down the hierarchy levels. And then that way I'll tighten down and only get back things that are higher in score than things that I already found in the higher levels of the hierarchy. But what if you get down to the bottom level of the hierarchy and you turn out to be wrong about the number of things that the lead level up? You start again. Yeah. Restart. It sucks. So I did a bunch of tests against NOAA data, satellite data. This is what NOAA satellite data looks like. Um, 
it's very dense in some places and none at all in other places. And I'll skip the exact results, but uh, no, I won't. I was able to, for a bunch of my queries, get response times that went from you know, 45 seconds, plus or minus 41 seconds, down to 23 seconds, plus or minus 23. Now, I've got 100 times as much data um, in some of these databases as in my, in my base database. So I'm still, you know, I'm still getting reasonable response times on average compared to what the scientists could have done before. Uh, so that was naive to adaptive. Contraction helped even more. And so I was able to come back with really cool, really cool performance results. Um, one of the problems that I had initially was so some searches would fail because I had exhaust memory um, or exhaust processing time. And it would only be some queries. So I'd run over 1,000 seconds on some queries, but many other queries against exactly the same data would complete in under a second. Massive variability. By adding the filter, I was able to pretty much remove the searches in my search suite that died due to running out of resources. Um, my adaptive re relaxation reduced response times and variability by about 50%, and contraction added, oh, got a, another 20 to 25% for affected searches, which are really cool improvements in performance, unless you're trying to go for 100 times the performance, in which case it's not so great. Uh, but I ended up implementing adaptive relaxation and contraction, and that's, that's what's in the production version today. So then I moved on to, okay, I've got this really cool thing where you can do any kind of hierarchy and any kind of segmentation and any number of hierarchy levels that you want. And my, my system works just fine, except it may not perform that well. Um, and it lets you download any subset of data that you're interested in that, that I've segmented into. <clears throat> but some of these hierarchies will perform better than others. So let me try eight different hierarchy versions um, and see whether I can begin to build a model that predicts which ones will perform well and which ones won't. And one of my hierarchies is actually the no hierarchy. So that's where I treated every single data set as though it were completely independent. And then there was some where I aggregated on, on time and then space, some where I did space and then time, some where I mixed them up. So I tried to build like a pretty good representation of different points in space of what these hierarchies might look like. Different number of levels, um, three level hierarchy, five level hierarchies, to see what happened. And the answer was a mess. <laughs> uh, this is one of the suites. This is actually the space suite. Um, the number of seconds response time is up the axis there. So 180 seconds is about as high as it goes for this set. These are two different data sets that I was running against, so different, uh, different types of data. And each query across the bottom, and then each one of these squares is, is a different hierarchy. Um, we created a heap of slides like this, a heap of charts. And Kristen and Dave and I spent a long, many long time staring at them and trying to come up with hypotheses on what might work. Um, we identified two things. Some queries are always bad. And like the old joke with going to the doctor and saying it hurts when I do this, what should I do? The answer is don't do that. Um, the other, before I cleaned up these, these was that um, the consistent pattern was I'd load the data into Excel and Excel would randomly assign different ones of the, the tests, hierarchies to different symbols. And the thing that it was assigning small blue diamonds to was always the best hierarchy. What we couldn't figure out was how Excel knew to assign 
those little blue symbols to the best performing hierarchy. If we could have figured that out, we could have predicted which hierarchy we should be using. <laughs> More? Right? And yeah, this, exactly, it was very depressing. So then I created more charts, and, and what this is, is I ordered the queries by the fastest, the, the shortest response time to the longest response time, no matter which query it was, and then mapped all of the hierarchies together. This one here is what happens when you don't have a hierarchy in place. Yeah. So for those of you who are questioning whether issuing you know, eight queries for eight levels of the whether I would have been better just doing one query with a table scan? No. Um, if I remove that one and redraw these, these other seven that are all going along the baseline here, there is actually quite a lot of feature here as well. Um, we did a whole bunch of these in different combinations and um, what we were able to figure out was the same set of queries always ends up over here, but we have no way of predicting which set of queries they're going to be for any, any database, for any, uh, any set of data. And there are some hierarchy shapes that aren't always good, but there are others that are always bad. That's the sum total of what we figured out after a whole lot of work. So performance result summary, um, uh, there was some very creative writing that happened in that section of my <laughs> dissertation, which ends up saying something like this, the performance is driven by the level of the hierarchy that has the most entries returned, you know, duh. If you get a lot of data back, it takes more time to process it. Uh, we were able to mess around and improve performance by about a third by doing some funky things, but we wanted much more performance than that. You can get really bad response times with both low density and high density data. I'm sure you will be shocked to know that. And after reading a whole bunch more papers, I found another paper that sort of justified for me, you know, I could reference it, so it must be true. No strategy is consistently the best across data distributions. Moreover, even over the same data sets, which strategy best works best for a particular query sometimes depends on the specifics of the query which is a really nice, efficient way of saying we have no clue. <laughs> and nobody else does either. So because I'm now in research, you know, I have a solution. Mm. More research is needed. <laughs> I'm sure that will shock all of you. Yes? So did you try looking, rather than looking at an op optimal approach, looking more at a harm reduction approach? That is, it matters less which is the fastest and which is not prohibitively slow. That's kind of what we ended up doing is throwing at, uh, trying to figure, well, we figured out a couple of ones that were prohibitively slow. One of the other things that one could do is to just have multiple hierarchies in multiple systems, issue the query on all of them, take the response back from the one that comes back fastest and throw the others away. I've, I've done that. If this space is no object, then you can do that. Correct. <laughs> Well, you can only opt, what's the thing? You can only optimize on one thing, right? Yeah. Cost, performance, yeah. space. Yeah. I, I think there's a whole bunch more interesting stuff. I, I had expected that I'd be able to come up with a prediction when I started this, and I, um, you know, it, it turned out to be a lot more confusing than I think any of us expected. Mm. So, where to from here? Um, I've got my PhD, but, you know, one must have future research plans. Um, first point that I think is, I, I built a system, it's one system. I've proved that this can be done, it works really well. You know, this is a big empty space, I've got one proof point. Um, I think that there's a heap of more work that could be done to make this work better, uh, faster, you know, for a whole bunch of different, uh, different spaces and I'd love to see some of that stuff done. Um, the model that I've got built, you know, right now, the data I've got in there is observational data, environmental data, but the model allows for a much more general scientific data search engine. 
right, the, at the abstract level. I just happen to have done this with one type of data. We're now talking to OHSU about the potential of doing a similar thing for genomics, which will require some changes to the, the tool implementation, but um, should require no changes to the underlying principles or the abstractions or the date or the, uh, the, the model. Um, I, there's also one of the things I'd like, one of the things we ran into in this section is I built this great scanner. It goes and it reads all of the data that CMOP has and makes it really easy to see what variables you have and what the mins and maxes and, and units are. And the first thing that the um, center director did was refuse to open it up to the public because now you could see what kind of a mess they had. <laughs> now, now you could see that water temperature was spelt 12 different ways and that there were 14 different units for something that should only have one and that there were variables that had mins and maxes that clearly were invalid. And you could search over it and find lists of those things and, you know, that was not, um, not a happy thing for the, the archive owner. I was interested that. Um from an archival perspective, doesn't that make it really easy to search through specific sub-archives though? So uh, like if you wanted, if the interface knew that there were all of these different variables in yes. the data set, and then it just automatically built that interface for you to search with. Yes. <laughs> yes. That's the, that's exactly the problem if you're the person who's trying to put on a really good face in terms of how clean your archive is. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> Uh, one comment on that arena. Yeah. Uh, open data for you generally is generations younger than the open source community. <coughs> and the open source community has learned the benefits of exposing their flaws for public scrutiny. And that needs to progress onto the open data arena. Yes. Because that's a positive, not a negative. Absolutely. Well, yes. It needs, to, it needs to progress in a management sense as well. Yes. Because mm -hmm. if we now have, thanks to, traditionally we can thank Microsoft for it. Is, is thanks to Microsoft, everybody accepts the idea that all software has bugs. And therefore, <laughs> like programmers exposing their bugs to the public mm -hmm. is not a career ending move. Mm -hmm. But people do not accept that, for example, publicly funded data sets have made your flaws. Oh, okay. And therefore, exposing your flaws to the public. But I think there's also. <laughs> well, I'm out of time, so yeah, we'll yes. have to have this discussion later. But I'd like to make one more point, which is. I think that there's actually tools that one can build, and I've built a couple of them in, in uh, uh, demo, to, to begin to address some of those. So for example, putting a gloss over, um, over the archive so that it appears to be a lot cleaner than it actually <laughs> is when you get down to the detail level, and, and some various other kinds of um, methods that allow people to still find stuff even if it's not all perfect under the covers. Um, it was a whole lot of fun, and I wish I'd written the paper on it yet, but I haven't. So, yeah, I'll stop right there. And I'd love to have this conversation later on. <laughs> and I had one person go to sleep, so I failed. <laughs> yes? So one of the things I did on a similar project where we were 